China is battling a new and rapidly spreading respiratory virus. The number of people infected has tripled to more than 200. And President Xi says it needs to be resolutely contained. There have now been 132 deaths, close to 6,000 cases, and 16 countries outside China have confirmed cases. It has been confirmed that there are two cases now in England. Does this virus have pandemic potential? Absolutely, it has. Are we there yet? From our assessment, not yet. Coronavirus is in our midst. Thousands of us could have it already, too many now for it to be contained. Our aim is for pubs open for the duration. You must stay at home. This is the front line in the war. Apart from two patients, every patient we're looking after has got COVID. We can't cope with a big spike. We just can't. So just breaking news coming into us within the past few seconds. Uh, the Prime Minister has been under the care of uh, doctors in a hospital in London and he is being now admitted into intensive care with those persistent symptoms of coronavirus. The UK has now become the first country in Europe to record more than 30,000 deaths uh, linked to coronavirus. Why do we have so many deaths? And where did the government go wrong? The 29th of January 2020. Two cases of coronavirus are confirmed in the UK. The pair from the same family are being treated at a specialist centre in Newcastle. Remember when we used to talk about Brexit? Now, that story just seems like a distraction, or even a sick joke, in comparison to what we're experiencing now. If you follow this channel for a while, you'll know I vote to leave the EU and for the Conservative government. And yet somehow, that night, I felt a sense of melancholy. At the time, I was questioning my political place in the world. Was I really a Remainer? Did I really fit with this country's beliefs? And why did I feel that this celebration was premature? And it was because, in the back of my mind, I knew the story hadn't ended. It wasn't just a case of defeating woke politics with a huge Tory majority. It wasn't just a case of answering the Brexit question with the definitive answer. And while we can be thankful that those things were in place going into this crisis, we have to admit that because of our blindsided pride in our country and the distractions of Brexit, the whole country, whether Remainers or Leavers, were surprised by coronavirus. But it's too simple and too divisive to simply blame nationalism and Brexit for a foreign virus. So how did a first world country with a nationalised health system suffer, both economically and health-wise, by something as common as a virus? Remember when life was normal? Well, back then, the government had four key strategies. Contain, to detect early cases and follow up on close contacts. Delay, to slow the spread within the UK. Research, to find out more about the vaccine and its treatment. And mitigate, to provide the best care possible for those who get ill and to minimise the overall impact on the economy. The advice was to isolate yourself for 14 days if you had come from Hubei province in China. But by the 25th of February, that had already changed to include Iran and parts of Italy, whether unwell or not. We see a big influx of cases, probably from Italy and Spain, looking at the um, genomics of the virus in early March. The truth is, even back in February, we didn't know how prevalent the disease could be in asymptomatic people. The EU nations failed to isolate their borders, and one man in Lombardy, Italy, was linked to spreading the disease and causing the devastation there. But research has shown that the first case in France was probably way back in December, which means it was probably already widespread in the UK too. But we didn't know when barriers are going up and when there is a risk that new diseases such as coronavirus 
will trigger a panic and a desire for, for market segregation that go beyond what is medically rational to the point of doing real and unnecessary economic damage, then, at that moment, humanity needs some government somewhere that is willing at least to make the case powerfully for freedom of exchange. Too blindsided by our ambition for a trade deal with the EU, the US and China to impose further travel restrictions or screening. For the moment, we are not witnessing the uncontained global spread of this virus and we are not witnessing large-scale severe disease or deaths. Does this virus have pandemic potential? Absolutely, it has. Are we there yet? From our assessment, not yet. The WHO failed to warn the world, and as a result, Britain trusted them too much. The 2nd of March. Don't forget, Laura, that uh, it is still the case that the single most useful thing that we can all do to support our NHS to stop the spread of uh, coronavirus is to wash our hands. Two times happy birthday, hot water and, and soap. Other than that, though, I wish to stress that at the moment, it's very important that people consider that they should, as far as possible, go about business as usual. Washing hands was never enough. We didn't know that at the time. A week later, the advice would evolve into isolating yourself for seven days if you had symptoms. Life appears to be continuing as normal here. Hundreds of people are still milling around in central London, but the UK is increasingly looking alone in Europe. Will this square be empty in two weeks time? And should it, like Italy, be empty now? And by the 12th of March, the government had changed its advice, moving out of the contain phase into the delay phase. They were reluctant to initiate a full lockdown because they assumed the people of the UK would get fed up with it too soon, making its results ineffective. That if you completely locked down absolutely everything, probably for a period of four months or more, then you would suppress this virus. All of the evidence from previous epidemics suggests that when you do that and then you release it, it all comes back again. So the other part of this is to make sure that we don't end up with a sudden peak again in the winter, which is even larger, which causes even more problems. So we want to suppress it, not get rid of it completely, which you can't do anyway, not suppress it so we get the second peak, and also allow enough, enough of us who are going to get mild illness to become immune to this to help with the sort of whole population response which would protect everybody. Yeah, I mean, that, that herd immunity, I know you talked about yesterday when you were appearing with the Prime Minister. In, in terms of building up a herd immunity within the UK, what, I mean, what sort of percentage of people need to have contracted the virus? Probably about 60% or so. The most damning words ever spoken about coronavirus here in the UK were made on the 13th of March. Although herd immunity was never the strategy, it was discussed as a byproduct and possible route out of lockdown. But it gave the public the impression that the government would willingly let people die and it reduced public confidence in them. A government that we were, and still are, trusting to keep our jobs our wages and our lives. We are in a situation of war, a health war. We're not fighting against any army or another nation, but the enemy is there. It's invisible and it's progressing. That requires our general mobilization. We are at war. And all the government's action and all the parliament's action has now got to turn towards the fight against this epidemic. Day and night, there is nothing that should distract us. First, we need to ask you to ensure that if you or anyone in your household has one of those two symptoms, then you should stay at home for 14 days. Germany and France went into lockdown on the 17th of March. Yet Britain, on the same day, was only just advising against going to theatres, pubs, clubs and cinemas and telling anyone in the same household as someone with symptoms to self-isolate. 
for 14 days. Our aim is for pubs open for the duration. This could go on for a long time. And I think that once you shut them down, it's very difficult. Supermarkets are very, very crowded. Uh, pubs are much less crowded. Uh, there's hardly been any transmission uh, of the virus within pubs. And I think it's over the top to shut them. Uh, that's a commercial view, but I think it's also a common sense view. Crucially, the government failed to make socialising and staying at home an obligation by law rather than a choice. Ultimately, a lot of social businesses chose to stay open as a result and many employees chose to go to work because they couldn't afford to live off statutory sick pay for a simple minor cough. Now, this might not have been the overwhelming causal factor in giving the UK the number of deaths that it had, but it certainly undermined the government strategy to do whatever it takes. On the 22nd of March, the government told anyone vulnerable from coronavirus to isolate for 12 weeks, meaning they won't be out of lockdown until the 14th of June this year. And finally, on the 23rd of March, the UK went into lockdown. You must stay at home because the critical thing we must do to stop the disease spreading between households. Now the real battle had to begin. Keeping the public on side with financial support. I said whatever it takes, and I meant it. Keeping the NHS from being overrun with free beds, ventilators and PPE. And crucially, proving that the sacrifice of lockdown was worth it. Of course, unlike our European neighbours, the UK could still exercise once per day and chop once per week. Now, to give the government credit, the public did largely stay on side, despite what Twitter might have you believe. Hospitals were always kept under capacity, with the Nightingale hospitals being built and barely used. And on ventilators, although the government declined to join the EU procurement scheme, and only achieved 8,000 of their 30,000 target for ventilators, ventilators themselves didn't really become an issue. PPE and testing, meanwhile, did. That at least 100 health and care workers have now died with coronavirus. That's according to a nursing website that's been recording fatalities since the outbreak began, a figure far higher than the 27 publicly verified by the government. A disproportionately high number have been from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. The UK actually invented the test for coronavirus on the 10th of January, and yet it took until the 30th of April to reach a questionable, at best, 122,000 tests per day, proving the UK was no longer the industrial hub it once was. Now I could go on forensically analysing each and every decision the government made and distorting it with hindsight. But that would be wrong, because it doesn't accurately betray the mood, knowledge and politics of the time, and an inquiry will likely draw its own conclusions. But it made me wonder. In this country we often fantasise about our wartime past as a great symbol of victory, remembrance, and the sacrifices those of that time made. Yet. By comparison, today's disaster is marred with bitterness. So is today really as bad, or are we just more bitter than our wartime relatives? So just breaking news coming into us within the past few seconds. Uh, the Prime Minister has been under the care of uh, doctors in a hospital in London, and he is being now admitted into intensive care with those persistent symptoms of coronavirus. Yes. There was a bitter element, criticising how on earth the man supposed to be leading the country could be so careless, so reckless, as to allow coronavirus into the heart of government and potentially leaving a country leaderless. I, 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 I'm shaking hands continuously. I was, at a, I was at a hospital the other night where I think there were, a few, there were actually a few coronavirus uh, patients and I shook hands with everybody, uh, you'll be pleased to know, and, and I continue to shake hands and uh, uh, I think it's very important that we, you know, People obviously can make up their own minds. I think that Matt has said that people must make up their own minds, but I think the scientific evidence is, well, I'll hand over to the, to, to the experts, but, but our, judgment, our judgment is wash. 
Uh, washing your hands is the crucial thing. But that news struck the nation most with fear. And in that fear came personal empathy and a gratitude to our health and care workers. The symbol of this crisis won't be a poppy or a peace sign like wartime, but a pair of hands reminding us of gratitude, care, and also the importance of pride in ourselves and others. In the years prior to this crisis, both the government and the people of Britain expressed a lack of these attributes. A lack of pride in the country, trust in the UK economy, resources and cheap labour to set up or keep manufacturing industries here in the UK. They've been proudly turning out steel at this plant for the past century and a half. But tonight, their future is Chinese. And in the hands of Li Gangpo, seen here in dark glasses, leading his delegation to agree a takeover that makes this former Communist Party boss a workers' hero here in the UK. A lack of care taken when invading places like Iraq and Syria and the consequences of that. There were extraordinary scenes in Libya today where the Prime Minister was greeted as a hero by the Libyan people. David Cameron and the French President Nicolas Sarkozy led the international military action against the Gaddafi regime and they are the first Western leaders to visit Libya. A lack of gratitude when cutting back public services including the NHS, and council funding to reduce the deficit after the economic crisis. I'll read out the following. Richard Fawcett, Senior Doctor in Emergency Medicine. I personally apologise to the people of Stoke for the third world conditions. Dr Taj Hassan, President of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. We are seeing conditions people have not experienced in their working lives. Dr Nick Scriven, President for the Society of Acute Medicine. The position is as bad as I've ever known. Tracy Bullock, another one, Chief Exec of Mid Cheshire Hospitals, who says, I'm 34 years in and I've never seen anything like this. So shall I ask that again? Is this a crisis? Well, as I say, I don't uh, dispute their experiences. It is very, very tough on the front line. But ultimately, I am accountable for the treatment of every patient in the NHS. I'm the health secretary and to people who've had their operations delayed because of the winter pressures that we're now facing, uh, I apologise because I recognise that it is a very, very big deal if you need a hip replaced and you're having to wait longer. Our lack of care and understanding when the divisions of Scottish independence or Brexit were laid bare. So I think for me and my future is better to stay in. And it's my generation that has to deal with the fallout if we go. So please think you're, of me. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think of you all the time, Charlotte. A lack in care and understanding of our BAME and elderly community. The UK government will do whatever it takes, including where appropriate payment of compensation, to resolve the anxieties and problems which some of the Windrush generation have suffered. These people are British. They are part of us. They helped to build Britain and we are all the stronger for their contributions. We have an ageing society. Our system will collapse unless we do something about it. That's what I'm saying. You can ignore it, you can put your head in the sand, or you can try and play politics with it. I think it's only fair to people to say this is a problem and we need to fix it now. That's what I want to do. Oh. I want to fix it. And those ultimately led to a lack of trust. Everyone went into their own echo chambers of the woke left or the populist right. And worst of all, Worst of all, nobody listened to the other side, as evidenced by Labour's whopping defeat in the election. The direct, causal reason for Britain having one of the most deaths in Europe is unknown. It's not because Britain is any worse or Germany is any better than the UK, but certainly evidence is that Britain forgot how to say thank you. We forgot how to keep calm and carry on, we forgot how to be British. And if we're all in this together, then we are all to blame. That we can turn the tide within the next 12 weeks. But do you agree with me? Join in the debate below and subscribe.